name is Nafla Poff. I am the Prevention Capacity Building Specialist at Iowa CASA. Before we get into uh, the, the actual panel, I wanted to just do a couple housekeeping pieces as the community tech support pointed out. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions during the panel, please use the Q&A Q &A section, section. That's where I will be checking. Uh, although if you don't have the Q&A, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll try to move them over as we can. And we also have closed captioning available. And so uh, please feel free to utilize that. If you can't see it, it should be in the more and there should be a CC at the bottom. So thank you all for attending our showing of Nevertheless. And also thank you to our wonderful panelists that are here today uh, to answer some questions and also answer your questions. We will start off with some introductions. Uh, I have a question for everyone except for Sarah to start off with. So we'll start with the rest of the group. Can you tell the audience a little bit about who you are, what you do, and how your work relates to sexual assault and harassment? And let's start with Max today. Sounds great. Well, howdy y'all. My name is Max Moitz. I'm the pro uh, program director at One Iowa. Um, One Iowa is actually the statewide LGBTQ advocacy organization. So we really focus on um, uh, LGBTQ liberation throughout the state. And that includes um, workplaces. And so one of the things that I think has come up, um, you know, through this film, but also th through our work is to understand and recognize the way that sexual harassment specifically targets and impacts um, LGBTQ individuals that are experiencing it. So um, that is a little bit of the work that I do um, within that role. Um, and I've been a person that's like done work within the sexual assault, sexual harassment space for a while. So it's something that's very, very like important to me um, and something I'm so excited to be chatting more about today, but that's a little bit about me. And my pronouns are they, them, a, a, and he, him, and l. Thank you so much. This is Nafla. Thank you, Max. Next, let's go to Elizabeth Bal Balcarcel. Hola, habla Elizabeth. Eh, buenas noches a todos. Eh, yo soy la directora del programa estatal de entrenamiento y asistencia técnica en la coalición de Iowa en contra del abuso sexual y um, mi trabajo se relaciona en, en a supervisar el, el equipo de asistencia técnica que son los encargados de garantizar que todos los centros estatales y, y otras entidades que están trabajando con sobrevivientes de abuso sexual consideran realmente todas las necesidades específicas de los sobrevivientes y cumplen las necesidades que ellos tienen a través del servicio directo que proveen a las víctimas. Y mis pronombres son femeninos, perdón. I left myself muted, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, we will go to Sansi. Hi, my name is Sansi Kingery. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, if you see something floating right here, that's my dog, I apologize. Um, she ignored me the entire time the film was, was rolling. And then as soon as we turned on our cameras, she decided she needed to be involved. So I apologize if that's distracting. I'll try to keep her out of our business. Um, but I am one of two staff attorneys at the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, we receive funding from the Office of Violence Against Women to assist uh, Survive, primary survivors of sexual violence, which includes um, rape, sexual assault, um, stalking, a um, variety of other kinds of um, actions, I suppose, um, who are 11 years old and older. 
um, and we can assist in a variety of different settings, one of which would be the workplace. Um, but we also can assist with sexual assault protective orders. Iowa has the option for a civil uh, protective order if you've experienced a sexual assault. Um, we can also assist with Title IX complaints, um, sexual misconduct complaints that aren't Title IX complaints, um, and, and just a variety of different legal issues related, directly related to someone experiencing a non-intimate partner um, incident of sexual violence. Thank you so much, Sansi. Uh, next, we will move on to Sarah. And for Sarah, my question for you is what interested you in making a film about sexual harassment and assault? Yeah. Um, well, I'm so honored to be here with all of you uh, hearing more about your bios. I'm just really honored to be here. Um, my, this is Sarah Moshman and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, yeah, this really started for me in 2017. I mentioned at the beginning, I was pregnant with my daughter Bryce. And as so many parents often feel when they're gonna be shepherding a, a kid into the world, uh, I wanted to help make the world any bit safer for her to exist in. And around that same time, uh, all of my friends, myself included, had stories, had experiences of working in the television industry specifically um, of being harassed, uh, assaulted, violated, disrespected, um, demoted, discriminated against. I mean, it was like we all had these war stories and yet we were all sort of also at the same time agreeing that that was just the price that you pay to be a woman in the film industry. And that never felt right to me. In fact, I remember going to my sexual harassment training for a television show I was working for and it was just a joke. I mean, it was like we all went over the rules and the curriculum, if you will, and everyone was laughing. I mean, most, it was mostly men on the crew, but they were all like making jokes and laughing. And I just so specifically remember thinking like, well, who's going to feel comfortable to come forward in this kind of environment? And sure enough, when it happened to me and, and many others on the show, um, it just felt like, oh, nobody's going to care about that. There's going to be no repercussions for, for this. So um, that sort of was a part of my psyche, certainly prior to 2017. But then I think coming into the parenthood role and knowing that I was gonna be having a daughter specifically as this happens a lot, obviously to girls and women. Um, I, I did the only thing I know how to do in that moment, which for me is to pick up the camera and get to work. Um, and so I started doing interviews in the fall of 2017. I found employment attorneys and human resource representatives and diversity and inclusion managers. I didn't really know what film I was making at first. I didn't have a clear picture um, in fact, at the time, it was just called Untitled Sexual Harassment Documentary. Uh, but the more I learned, the more I started to understand what I was trying to say. And I didn't want to make a film about the sensationalized headlines or, oh, how the mighty have fallen. You know, these like CEOs at the top of these billion dollar companies. Um, those stories and scenarios, of course, are important to spotlight. Um, don't get me wrong, but it felt like the media journalists collectively were ignoring the real problem here, which is the systems that are in place that got us here in the first place. So even if you oust the CEO, right, and get rid of the most egregious person, that really doesn't solve the problem at all, as all of you know very well. So um, that was really an evolution for me in making this film is the more interviews I did, and I probably did about 45 or so on camera interviews and I didn't end up using all of them. Um, I recognized that I wanted to, to focus on these sort of buckets of systematic issues like toxic masculinity, like our legal system, like how we socialize our children, and then have these personal intimate stories to really root the film. And in this version of the film, which is 50 minutes long, you hear four of the stories and I should mention, we do have a longer version of the film as well that's 80 minutes long that has seven stories. And in that version, we have a male survivor as well as a transgender woman of color who's undocumented um, and that she experienced gender discrimination in the workplace. So yeah, I, I, my intention was really to give a, a bigger snapshot of the problem rather than focusing in on just the film industry or just music or just one bad CEO. Um, and I wanted to add to the conversation that way. Sarah for making this film and allowing us to have this conversation today, as well as being willing to participate on this panel. 
So this qu next question is for anyone on the panel. Uh, let's talk about the film itself for a few moments. As professionals working in this field, this is all very familiar to you. Uh, what are some things that particularly stood out to you about these stories? Habla Elizabeth. Creo que una de las partes importantes que me llamó mucho la atención es cómo eh, este eh, documental eh, enfoca muy bien lo que viene siendo eh, la vida profesional eh, de las participantes donde, dentro de este documental. Eh, y me llama mucho la atención eh, cuando hablamos de esa diferencia entre accesibilidad para las víctimas, eh, cómo fue necesario que mujeres blancas pudieran levantar la voz para que se pudiera realmente eh, a prestar atención. Um, porque esto no es algo que está sucediendo nuevo. Esto siempre ha ocurrido. Hay muchas comunidades silenciadas con este tema, pero fue otra vez necesario que fuera un grupo de mujeres blancas quien levantara la voz para poder realmente darle la importancia y la relevancia que tiene este tema. Yes, uh, this is Max. Um, yeah, I completely agree and echo that sentiment. I think that the, you know, the conversation around the Me Too movement um, and how pervasive, um, you know, sexual harassment and assault is, um, was really like very clear and obvious from the different stories because you have these folks that had these experiences back in like, what, 2004, 2007, um, if I'm getting the dates correct. And then now, you know, fast forward, 10-ish years and all of a sudden it's like, oh no, that's incorrect, that shouldn't have happened X, Y, Z. And so I thought that the film did a really good job, like kind of setting up the way that this very, very powerful group of white, um, very upper class women, um, you know, called attention to this uh, this phenomenon that had been taking place, uh, obviously, for, you know, hundreds of years, and is very much baked into kind of the colonial history of the United States, right? And so um, it, it was a very interesting way to kind of pay attention to the way that power dynamics play out, even in the liberation of the people that are impacted by sexual assault and sexual harassment. So that was something that I thought was really, like, that kind of surprised me watching the, uh, the film is just, um, you know, how clear and obvious that like power differ differential was between the people who were bringing awareness to it and the people that experience it all the time um, and, and have experienced it. So it was just something that uh, really caught my eye as well. What I always find um, shocking, but not surprising, in these situations is just how many people are, always, are, are, I guess, targeted by the same person and how there's never just one. And it's important when we talk about sexual harassment needing to be, you know, uh, pervasive and severe um, where people can feel so isolated by, you know, when they're the, when they're the target, the person experiencing the harm but there's, there's never just one. And um, it really takes, you know, one or two people coming forward and talking and speaking out, and then just a whole bunch of other people come out. And, it, you know, when, when people feel isolated like that and don't feel like there's anyone else, um, it's easy to think, it, it's understandable to, to feel like oh, if I come forward, nothing's gonna happen because I'm, I'm, I'm the only one. And, you know, people don't think about, well, is it pervasive? <laughs> that's a, you know, that's a lawyer thing. Um, but, you know, they'll, they'll think things like, well, if it just happened to me, it's not a big deal. I'm going to be the target. If I'm the only one who speaks out, I'm going to get, you know, retaliation. I'm going to get fired. And certainly that happens all the time. Um, but it always just strikes me when watching or listening to think to stories like this, that, you know, it's never just one person who experiences 
the harassment um and how even though that that seems to be the overwhelming fact it is still incredibly isolating to experience that that harassment so those are my thoughts thank you all so much uh, I'm going to stay on the topic of the film right now. I see that we are getting some wonderful questions in the Q&A, and I'll get to those in a little bit. And so please continue asking. Uh, Sarah, how did you find the individual stories featured in the film as well as the experts? Yeah, so this was quite an undertaking. Um, as a filmmaker, this issue is obviously timeless, unfortunately, but also is very timely. Um, I, be I began filming this in October 2017, right as the Harvey Weinstein story broke uh, in the New York Times and then hashtag me too was soon to follow. Um, so for a filmmaker, that's kind of a dream come true and also kind of a nightmare because you're like, oh no, how am I gonna do justice to these, this movement, these stories? What am I trying to say? You just feel like you can never make the film fast enough because it's so timely. Um, but I took a breath <laughs> and started to think about what I was trying to say, You know, what kind of film I was trying to make. And I worked with a wonderful research producer named Carla um, and together, I mean, for better or for worse, there were stories coming out every single day, you know, in the media. So we were really consuming a lot in terms of articles and interviews and just really taking note of what was happening in our country, this reckoning. Um, and as we know, social movements really take two steps forward, one step back, right? So there's been a huge backlash when it comes to Me Too as well. I can't tell you how many people have said to me in, in talking about making this film, um, especially older white men saying, uh, well, I can't even ride an elevator anymore with a woman without being worried about being accused of sexual harassment. And it's like, what? That completely misses the point. So it just, it only fueled my fire to want to bring this all together and really, you know, be able to, to create empathy through these stories. Because I think my goal, and with any filmmaker, you want your audience to see a piece of themselves or someone they know in one of the stories that they hear. And I wanted men certainly to feel welcome to this conversation, if not essential, to this conversation. I also never wanted the film to be very women versus men, very binary, um, but to really open it up and say, hey, we can't do this alone. I, I'm, I'm even training myself to stop using the term women's issues, which is really tough, right? But I love how Jackson Katz in the film breaks that down of when we say women's issues, it, it allows men to completely tune out as if we're talking about periods or something, something that does still have to do with them, but they pretend to have nothing to do with. So um, finding these stories, and again, I mentioned there's seven stories in the longer version, what we just watched had four. Um, finding those seven individual stories was, was quite a journey. It took, well, every bit, every bit of a year to really kind of solidify all seven. Um, I had heard Patricia Brooks, the 911 dispatcher story. Um, I was talking to Mariko and Jessica, the, the legal counsel that you see in the sort of passing of SB 1300. I met them first. And they kept mentioning Brooks v. City of San Mateo. They kept mentioning this case as like the perfect example of SB 1300. And so eventually on one of our calls, I was like, okay, who's Brooks? Like, I think I need to talk to Brooks, whoever that is. Um, and so I reached out to Patricia and, and as you saw in the film, her story really doesn't have a happy ending in terms of what happened to her, but the passing of this law really is her happy ending. It is the way that her story matters and her story has impact. And so she wanted to be part of the film to be able to help pass the law to be, you know, it all went together and for her to really have some semblance of justice in terms of making sure that this doesn't happen to other women. Um, so her story to me spanned over, you know, 30 years and really results in this passing of a law, you know, in very much present day, which felt like a beginning, middle and end to me. Um, and then Imani Lyle, the Friends Writer's Assistant, I had heard that story many times working in the film industry. It's sort of this like infamous case. In fact, it's taught in law schools apparently um, all over the country. So it was sort of this infamous case I wanted to learn more about. So I reached out to her. Um, tech, you know, we're rampant with sexual harassment in the tech industry. So um, Cheryl Suhoy, who came up with the hashtag moving forward, that was a lot in the media. And then funnily enough, Juliet and Lily, the mother daughter in the school dress code story, that's my old middle school in um, Evanston, Illinois. When I attended that middle school, it was spaghetti strap tank tops that we weren't allowed to wear. 
Uh, but I didn't have the vocabulary. None of my peers, none of us had the vocabulary of activism. Like we certainly did protest things, but I don't think we knew all of these words and terms and we couldn't articulate them in the way that Juliet and Lily did. And so it was really exciting to me to be able to shine a light on this next generation of activists and to make sure that we talk about how early this starts, you know, and how even in the school age, we need to be having these conversations. So all different ways. Um, and I'm so, so, so grateful to all these seven individuals, but of course, also the incredible experts that lended their voice. I learned so much. And in fact, I have a binder of all the transcripts that's like 532 pages of information that I went through and like highlighted and put it all together. So in some ways I'm like, was I writing a thesis or making a movie? I'm not sure, but um, somehow it all came together in this package. <laughs> of the topics that you were talking about uh kind of how pervasive well the shift of culture from before the me too movement to after and not still not necessarily to gain ownership of of one's own actions be them male or female um kind of points to one of our q a questions so i wanted to highlight that one Watching the film, I realized that we have been feeding what we know of the outdated rules to every every generation or before us. How do we stop the unconscious behaviors from occurring? What can we do instead to grow from this? And I believe that is a question for any one of the panelists. I mean, I suppose I'll start with that. I'm not an expert, but what I know is that really shining a light on the problem helps, you know, being able to share our stories. As I just said, we didn't have the vocabulary for activism in the same way that we do now. When I was at that middle school and they were like, no spaghetti strap tank tops, we were like, okay, I guess that's how it is. So being able to pass on this spirit of activism and hey, you don't have to settle for the status quo because it's really not working for most people. Um, so I would hope that being able to pass on these tools um, to that next generation and then they come up and say hey you've been putting up with this for this long it doesn't have to be this way i think that's exciting yeah this is max um i also think that one of the things that was really well highlighted in the film and i'm sure even more so in the longer version is the ways that we have to talk about this and we have to pay attention to the way that different identities intersect with each other because so often movements like this get kind of washed by the most powerful that of people that are bringing awareness to the issues as we've kind of already talked about right and so it's not just um sexual harassment but it's sexual harassment as it plays off of racism um it's sexual harassment as it plays off of um like fempho fempophobia things like that and so um you know talking about of course in in my work we think a lot about um how sexual harassment um really impacts the LGBTQ community, which is also a community that intersects with all other identities too. So I think that that's uh, something that I really hope that we see next and we see in the future that that can change is to talk about that, the, the complexity surrounding the ways that this issue can impact somebody on a bunch of different um, intersecting layers and how we can do that community care for those folks um, with that in mind, with that um, those experiences of trauma in mind as well. Um, I'm Elizabeth. I think it's very important to look at that intersectionality que, que se menciona durante eh, el, el la película, porque uh, si nos enfocamos en lo que representa para los sobrevivientes inmigrantes, vamos a poder ver cómo este tema del de acoso sexual en el trabajo se vuelve muy complejo y muy difícil de navegar para los sobrevivientes. Si empezamos por eh, las barreras culturales, nos vamos a dar cuenta que muchos de ellos ni siquiera tienen las palabras para poder expresar lo que les está sucediendo. Y además de eso, vienen de un sistema eh, que usualmente ha sido opresivo. Para ellos esto se vuelve una una forma de vida la que ta, la que ha normalizado hasta cierto punto y si a eso le agregamos las barreras del idioma 
que una vez que yo estoy experimentando, a veces ni siquiera tengo el acceso a poder tener un intérprete que me ayude a comunicar lo que, lo que me está sucediendo. Muchas veces esos intérpretes, que, que las personas que se utilizan como intérpretes son esas mismas personas que están en liderazgo eh, en, dentro de estas empresas. Um, otra cosa muy importante también es que se desconoce completamente cómo funciona el sistema, cómo es ese proceso con el que tengo que caminar. Y, a, y si a eso le agregamos el estatus legal de la, del sobreviviente, eso representa un miedo grande para ellos. Ellos no quieren verse envueltos en el sistema legal, lo que representaría para ellos perder su trabajo um, eventualmente no tienen ese, esas beneficios de poder decir, puedo solicitar trabajo en cualquier otro lugar. Um, muy importante también las opciones de su trabajo se limitan. Eso representa un impacto económico para sus familias muy grande. Uh, y el poder y el control uh, que ejercen estas personas que están sirviendo como líderes en estas empresas y están conectando a esos inmigrantes a, esto, a ese trabajo. Nuestra comunidad, aunque ha crecido, sigue siendo una comunidad muy pequeña y el estigma y la vergüenza que esto representa para los sobrevivientes es algo eh, que causa un gran impacto. De alguna manera, nuestra comunidad está conectada, ya sea eh, pertenecemos a esa misma comunidad, a esa misma comunidad de fe, a esas mismas tiendas locales a los que ellos se conectan. Entonces, sigue siendo muy pequeña y de alguna manera era, ya sea el sobreviviente o la persona que ca causa el daño, eh, de alguna manera está conectado con alguien que los conoce, a alguien que está relacionado con ellos y esto representa una, un reto muy grande para ellos. Um, Sabemos de antemano que las leyes no están hechas para apoyar a las víctimas y que hay, hay, hay una gran necesidad de crear un gran cambio en esas leyes, pero aún, as, aún con esto, esas leyes no están hechas para atender las necesidades específicas de las comunidades inmigrantes y agregándole su estatus legal aún es más complicado. Cuando se han implementado estos cambios y en estas leyes, muchas veces las personas que estamos de, dentro de este movimiento se nos ha olvidado incluir esas voces y poder realmente escuchar cuáles son las otras opciones de justicia social uh, que ellos quieren ver. No necesariamente quiere decir que se quieren involucrar con un sistema legal y cuáles son esas otras opciones que nosotros estamos ofreciendo para ellos. Um, los sistemas de, de abogacía muchas veces están blanqueados y no representan las necesidades culturales que tienen los sobrevivientes inmigrantes. Um, no llenan sus necesidades específicas. Aparte de eso, si le agregamos también que muchos de ellos están limitados con el personal que puede proveer estos servicios a esos inmigrantes. Y... Uh, con esto es la, la escasez de fondos realmente para retener a esas personas que pueden dar estos servicios específicos um, porque no les podemos recompensar de una manera apropiada de su trabajo. for bringing light to that. And you touched a bit on the survivor experience, especially the immigrant survivor experience. Um, how are the stories similar, uh, the stories in the, the film similar to the stories of survivors that you've worked with throughout your career and how are they different? Habla Elizabeth otra vez. Creo que en general lo que es el impacto que ellos sufren eh, eh, es muy similar, uh, pero para hacia esto le agregamos todas esas dificultades del sistema que ellos tienen que navegar. Nos vamos a dar cuenta que es mucho más complicado para ellos buscar los recursos. Es muchas veces es extremadamente tan complicado que prefieren mejor mantener ese silencio, porque si no les damos a escoger eh, que ellos hagan un reporte, que ellos busquen la justicia, a que lleven un sueldo 
sueldo a su casa para poder alimentar a su familia, definitivamente no, no van a dudar en escoger, en prefiero quedarme callado y continuar haciendo este trabajo. Um, creo que muchas veces se nos olvida que eh, lamentablemente eh, son personas que están tratando de sobrevivir eh, cada día y que no tienen esa opción de poder eh, ir a pedir un desempleo, de ir a poder otros recursos, que realmente los recursos para ellos están muy limitados. Y si a eso le agregamos este ambiente político antimigrante que se ha creado por los últimos años en contra de las comunidades inmigrantes, esto realmente representa... Un, una, un reto muy grande para todas esas asesoras que están tratando de, 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 uh, de alguna manera este, implementar esos servicios que requieren, que requieren los uh, sobrevivientes inmigrantes. Moves well into a question that I have for Sunsi. Uh, what services and protections would be available to the survivors featured in this film if their experiences were happening in Iowa right now? Yes, this is Sunsi. Um, I um, want to first acknowledge that obviously, as an attorney, I'm coming from this from a very strict legal standpoint. The law, as Elizabeth pointed out, the legal system and the laws on the books do not help every, every survivor in every situation. And not every survivor wants to participate in the legal system. And there are lots and lots of reasons for that. And all of them are legitimate. <laughs> you know, it might be because of immigration status. It may be because the survivor themselves has a criminal record or are worried about credibility issues. Um, language barriers, disabilities, there's a whole list of things. And every single one of them are legitimate reasons why they won't, we don't want to participate in the legal system. And it's weird to say that as an attorney, because I'm supposed to be like, we love the law. And the law is cool sometimes, but not always. And um, so I want to first acknowledge that yes, the answer and, and you know, that I'm giving is very, very narrow as to the legal options. It isn't talking about other issues like restorative justice and those, those things. Um, but the, the movie did touch on some of the options that people have as to um, reporting or taking legal action against somebody who has sexually harassed them. And um, there's the option obviously to report to your supervisor. And I won't, don't want to try to get, I don't want to get them conflated. There is a civil process that somebody can go to, go through um, that involves the Iowa Civil Rights Commission and possibly a, a civil lawsuit for damages, back wages, any of those things that they're entitled to under the law. Some of the sexual harassment that people will experience also could qualify as a criminal action. Um, for example, the 911 operator who her experience probably in Iowa, I would argue that that fits the definition of a sexual assault. Um, and so there are different, there's sort of two separate legal spheres involved there. Um, you have the option and not all sexual harassment will qualify as a criminal act. <laughs> um, I, I would think that anything that qualifies as a criminal act would qualify as sexual harassment. Um, but, you know, criminal wise, you can report to, to law enforcement, um, pursue charges, depending on the situation, you know, a protective order may be appropriate, a criminal protective order, um, those sorts of things. The other option is the civil way. Uh, the civil legal way, and that is to pursue some sort of damages through um, a, a civil lawsuit. In Iowa, um, 
the Iowa Civil Rights Commission takes um, complaints of sexual harassment in the workplace and um, adjudicates those, makes a decision based on the current legal standards, whether or not sexual harassment has occurred. And the standard in Iowa is very similar to what it, to what it is in the, was in the, in the film. Um, and in Iowa, we also have the hostile work environment and the quid pro quo um, types of sexual harassment. And so that can be reported to the Iowa Civil Rights Commission and they do a fact, they basically do an investigation um, and gather information and can come to a decision as to whether or not sexual, the, the situation meets the definition of sexual harassment and if that employee is entitled to, legal titled <laughs> to um, damages. And those damages could be based on back wages. Um, maybe they had health insurance that was connected to their um, work. And when they were, if they were terminated or left because of the harassment, they had medical health, health insurance uh, questions um, or costs, sorry that came up that wouldn't, they wouldn't have had to pay otherwise, those could be included in that. Um, you know, those, the money things, which some people that makes them feel really good, right? That, um, but it doesn't always work for everybody and not everybody wants that and either way is totally cool. Um, so, so that's one way is through the Iowa Civil Rights Commission. Um, and the Iowa Civil Rights Commission can say, hey, employer, you owe them X amount of money because you did this bad thing. Um, you know, there's also the option once a civil rights um, complaint has been adjudicated and a decision has been made, they can file a civil case in district court um, to, to seek those sorts of remedies. And they're, they're pretty similar to what the Civil Rights Commission would be awarding. Um, but the other option or the, the other thing to keep in mind is if someone quits or is fired in retaliation for complaining, for reporting sexual harassment, they may wanna file an unemployment claim. And in Iowa, if you, if you voluntarily leave a job or are fired, you may not be eligible for unemployment. There are exceptions to that. If the employer, if, if the employee can prove that they left because they were being sexually harassed, um, and it's, it's a you know a lower standard, then they may still be entitled to to unemployment benefits. So, if somebody has to leave or is fired, that shouldn't be a barrier to going ahead and fi and filing for unemployment benefits. Um, they just would need to be prepared to present evidence to the the hearing officer that the reason that they left or were fired was due to sexual harassment. So. Thank you so much, Sunsi, for sharing all of that. Uh, next, there is a question in the Q&A section that I want to get to. Um, and so this is going to be a little bit of a two-parter because the question is, what is the top, what are the top action items we are recommending? So changing laws, educating boys, et cetera. While that percolates, I want to give Max the opportunity to tell us about the sexual harassment prevention work that they have been working on with the Iowa with the Iowa businesses and organizations. And Max, if you would like to elaborate beyond that after uh, you address your prevention work, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is Max again. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in our work at One Iowa, we really do focus on, like I said, workplace culture. That's one of our strategic focuses. And this is a big part of that because 70% of LGBTQ people have experienced sexual harassment at work in the workplace. Um, we see those numbers actually be like really, really high um, for LGBTQ Black, Indigenous people of color, um, as well as LGBTQ people with disabilities. Um, and so we know, again, 
then um, that in our work, we have to be paying attention to this when we're doing workplace training specifically. Um, and a lot of what we do in our workplace trainings is trying to give folks um, an understanding into how to talk about LGBTQ people in a respectful way and with dignity. Um, and part of that is to understand what's acceptable and what's unacceptable, because um, a lot of the sexual harassment that LGBTQ people face is um, unwanted comments about their sexual activity or relationship status and um, unwanted comments about their gender identity. Um, a lot of people don't know, for example, and something we, we cover extensively is talking about what questions are invasive to ask a trans or non-binary person. Um, so a lot of people will ask really invasive questions about the um, physical um, transitions of trans and non-binary people as well as their um, sexual relationships. And a lot of people do this under the guise of curiosity when we know um, it's a part of this larger pattern of um, sexual harassment, right? Um, but, you know, a part of the work that we do is trying to make a, under individuals recognize and understand the ways that those questions are invasive and they are harassment. Um, because if you're asking somebody, for example, if they use hormones or have gotten surgeries, what you're asking them in no uncertain terms is what their genitals look like, which is unacceptable and is harassment. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's just one small piece of the work, but I think it's, it's cluing people into, um, you know, something that is that like not everything, um, you know, curiosity is not enough of a reason to ask a question. And in fact, it's often very, very harmful and makes people feel very, very unsafe at work. Um, but then also, um, you know, moving forward from that as well, just talking about what kind of um, conversations, what kind of talks you can have with LGBTQ um, coworkers or uh, colleagues that are reasonable, that makes sense. So um, I think that uh, one of the things we really try to do is uh, build our trainings and that education from the ground up, trying to get people in on the, the ground floor of like what it means to be LGBTQ and how these things can feel invasive and moving into, you know, this is what could look like um, sexual harassment, whether or not you mean it to, um, you know, we have to, we have to pay attention to those things. So that's part of it as well, as well as talking about like larger issues, um, like discrimination throughout the, the nation and the state, um, the ways that LGBTQ people are discriminated against constantly um, in workplace settings, in healthcare settings, um, in education settings, all these different places as well. So that's something that we, we do um, try to address in, in our work as well. And I think we're always working on that as well. Um, but uh, when it comes to like next action steps, I think that one of the things that kind of popped out to me is I would love us to see a world in which we can envision restorative justice in the sexual harassment and sexual assault space and what abolition looks like in that space as well. Um, because I do believe that the active law enforcement can be really challenging. We've already talked about this quite a bit, right? Um, but law enforcement can often have a really negative impact on, on outcomes um, when people are reporting, when people are trying to seek justice in whatever way that makes sense for them. And a lot of people do not feel safe with police being a part of that conversation. And so I'd love to have more conversations, more dialogue about restorative justice, what that can look like and ways to remove policing from the work that we do. Could I just ask you to define restorative justice briefly, um, just so for those of us that aren't involved in the movement uh, to have an idea of what it is. Sorry, I was muted. This is Max again. Um, yeah, so uh, restorative justice can look like a lot of different things for different people. So I don't wanna like speak too generally here, um, but restorative justice is the idea of creating justice that lives outside of like our, um, that lives outside of our legal system and that can actually create like long lasting generational change. Um, so as opposed to having someone commit a crime and having them serve a sentence and that's justice, which we know um, it, it really isn't. Um, instead having um, a, a conversation about why, what took place took place um, and how to, um, you know, create healing in the process for um, the folks that were impacted by whatever action that was taken, but also the folks that like created that action to begin with and how we can do community care and care for the people that are all involved. Um, and, and it's 
it's such a like a broad thing. I, I'm sure I could give like a whole <laughs> presentation. So I'm sorry if I'm just like totally butchering the definition here, but um, that's what I think of when I think of restorative justice, thinking about these ways that we create long-term justice as opposed to this really short-term um, punishment oriented kind of carceral state motivated justice that we think of as the justice system that can um, look really, really different. So uh, that's what I think of. But again, um, I would highly recommend doing um, some additional research and and, um, uh, and getting involved in, in what that can look like in a space that uh, you that makes you feel comfortable and makes sense for you too. So thank you. I'll let of it. Y solamente me gustaría agregar a lo que Max acaba de decir, es cómo podemos eh, otorgarle la responsabilidad de toda una comunidad para poder asistir las necesidades del sobreviviente y no solamente que uh, depender de un sistema legal. Creo que aquí incluye eh, todo lo que eh, pudiera estar al alcance del sobreviviente para poderse sentir satisfecho y poder sentir que realmente le estamos dando la atención que, que él necesita o ella necesita. Entonces, más que nada involucrar es responsablemente a todas las partes que podemos colaborar para mejor el, mejorar el sistema de vida del sobreviviente. action steps that people would like to highlight to institute change? Yeah, I just want to add in, and I think there's some incredible resources being put in the chat, which is really amazing. Um, for me, as someone outside of this work in the same way as all of you, to me, it's about meeting people where they are, right? So not everyone's going to file a lawsuit or even be able to speak up due to economic livelihood constraints. Um, sometimes your best action item is to be a good listener. And if somebody comes to you after having an experience like this for you to say, I believe you, I mean, that's a powerful experience for a victim or survivor. It's just to know that they have someone to turn to. So it some, some of us are gonna have these huge action items and we wanna change the world. And some of us, it's gonna be these smaller interpersonal experiences that might mean the world to one person. So um, I think about that a lot. It's like not everyone's going to be this on the front lines of a protest, like holding a sign. Um, some of us are, are better utilized in a more interpersonal, person-to-person -person way. So I hope that after watching a film like this and hearing conversation as dynamic and important as this one, that no one feels overwhelmed by like, well, what do I even do? We all have a role here, uh, a different one, certainly, um, de depending on our position of privilege, as we talked about intersectionality is a really important part of this conversation. So um, for me, you know, filmmaking is my activism. So my contribution to the movement is to make a film, but not everyone's going to do that. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't fight these cases in, in court, but Sansi can, you know, so it's, it's up to each of us to find our role in this solution because truly it's going to take all of us for a change to, to really happen. Well, I want to I want to combine the the state the three statements that were were made by Elizabeth and Max and Sarah, and I want to first uh, acknowledge that I agree that the legal system is not the best solution as it stands right now, and there are lots and lots of reasons why that is. And um, in a perfect world, people wouldn't have to be re-traumatized by the legal system, by law enforcement and judges and opposing counsel attorneys and depositions and all of those things that they go through. Um, you know, and far as far as follow, you know, future action steps, I, I don't, I'm not convinced that passing more and more laws is the best number one best solution. And <laughs> it's weird to say that as an attorney, but you know at the end of the day laws are just little more than words and if the laws go away tomorrow and the attitudes haven't changed what what is it for you know um and you know as sarah was saying people have different roles to play and even though i don't i do believe that there are other options for survivors outside of the legal system 
my role is to help them inside of the legal system if they choose to do that. And so if there is somebody who wants to file a criminal case, like, let's go. You know, my job is to be there and I'm going to tell you the pros and cons. I'm going to prep you as best as I can, let you know what your options are, all of those things. And if you, if that person wants to go and do that, we're going to go and do that. If they want to file, you know, a, a civil case or a complaint with the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, we're going to go and do that. And if that's what they feel like is going to be best for them, my job is to, to tell them these are the pros and cons, the risks and rewards involved here, you know, these are your options. And I will, as your attorney and as someone familiar with advocacy, I will support you in those decisions, whatever you wanna do. Habla Elizabeth. A mí solo me gustaría agregar eh, por último que algo que a mí me gustaría mirar de cambio es que los movimientos, los nuevos movimientos que están impulsando las voces de los sobrevivientes y los líderes con poder incluyan las comunidades oprimidas en la toma de decisiones eh, cuando se trata de los recursos para los sobrevivientes. Es algo que me encantaría mirar. for one more question. Uh, what would each of you like to see those the participants, the viewers of today's film take away from the film or the panel discussion tonight? Ooh, this is Sarah. So many things, so many, I think, incredible resources and, and points of view were shared this evening. Um, so thank you all for that. But uh, just that we're all in this together. I mean, it's, it really can't be about us versus them or good or bad. I think all of us share, at least tonight, you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in the, in the power of change and the power of this movement to actually uh, change the course of, of history in terms of what we want to see in the future. So um, I always come away from events like this feeling really uplifted. Although we've heard some painful stories tonight, it is encouraging to to share space with people that are really doing the work on the ground, you know, fighting this behavior, fighting for our future. So um, I hope that the people tonight come away with some, some semblance of hope that there, we all have a role in the solution and that it is possible. This isn't, it truly isn't that complicated what we're trying to unfold here um, for, our, for our children, our children's children. So I, I hope there's a, some cautiously optimistic hope <laughs> of what's possible. Um, yeah, this is Sansi. Going off of what Sarah just said and, and kind of what I said at the very beginning about, you know, people feeling isolated. Uh, you know, the takeaway is I would like people to know that you're not alone, you know, both in your experiences and in seeking help. There are resources out there for you. Um, uh, Iowa Casa can be a resource. Your local you know, advocacy center can be a resource. Um, so you know, I just don't want people to to leave feeling like it's such a, it has it's an isolating experience, but it doesn't have to remain that way. Um, habla Elizabeth. Eh, yo creo que me gustaría que se llevaran la esperanza. Creo que sí hay esperanza. Este, sé que también este es un camino largo que tenemos que, que re recorrer, pero um, siempre he dicho que la unión hace la fuerza y cada uno en lo que estamos haciendo eh, en su área de trabajo eh, está haciendo cosas grandes, cosas maravillosas. Creo que solamente nos hace falta eh, conectarnos, que no se olviden de conectarnos y apoyarnos mutuamente unos a otros. This is Max. Um, yeah, I would absolutely agree with all the comments that have been made. Um, yeah, and I think um, 
one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, the ways that you can, um, you know, think about the stories that are being shared. I think this film did a good job talking about a lot of people's experiences, especially the, the longer version, right? Um, but think about whose stories are being told the most and why that is, right? Because a lot of people feel duly isolated, not just because they're experiencing this harassment, but because um, of the identities that they hold and the ways that um, oppression intersects for them. So if they can't, um, you know, th that makes it all the more isolating when all of the, the stories that you hear about sexual harassment are by people that are in positions of power that um, are, are different from yours, right? So uh, thinking about that, trying to open and broaden the narrative, trying to make sure that you're, you're asking a lot of people their experiences and connecting with that, I think is also really important as well. answers. I know I'm not on the panel, but I would like to answer this question um, in that I would like us to leave with the knowledge that change is possible. We, The fact that we are able to have this conversation, that we are having this conversation today, means that people do care and are trying to shift. Um, and so that is what I would like <laughs> My, my last perspective uh, on that piece. And with that, I would like to thank you all for attending. I would like to especially thank our wonderful panelists, Max, Elizabeth, Sarah, and Zanzi, for taking the time out of their evenings to answer these wonderful questions. And I would also like to point out that you will all have access to the film and a recorded panel discussion that we just had uh, following this event. So that will be sent in your email and there will also be resources uh, along with that. So with that, thank you so much for attending this showing of Nevertheless. Thank you. Thank you.